All right, guys, welcome back. This is part two of Outside the Podcast. This is the state of Jordan uh, retros, a new product. We're still talking about that. If you missed the first show, check down below. There's a link that'll take you to that so you can get caught up on the first part of this episode. Uh, but I'm not here by myself again. I'm here with Brandon, Nick, and our special guest today is Russ Bankston. Um, so let's get right back into the conversation and start off with uh, the Westbrook Zero. Uh, Russ, on the, on, the, on, the, on the first show, you mentioned the, the Westbrook Zero and the future you kind of see for Jordan brand as far as outside of their, their retro, I mean, uh, yeah, outside of their retro product. Um, how do you, do you see the Westbrook Zero being a, a standalone product or, or kind of ushering in a new era, I guess, of, of shoes that people look for outside of retros for Jordan? I mean, I think it can. I don't know if the, you know, the relative success or non-success, which I don't know, of the Westbrook, you know, would really speak towards whether it works or not. You know, maybe it's the guy, maybe it's the design, maybe it's whatever. Um, you know, I just feel like assuming the product plays a role in sales and the style plays a role there's just so, so much more you can do with an off the court shoe instead of on the court. You know, I feel like for Jordan, especially, you know, flight plates obviously been a thing. The, the encapsulated zoom air in the forefoot, you know, everything's moving towards a synthetic upper with some sort of external heel counter. You know, there's sort of a best way to do it as far as a performance product. And if it's going to be an on court shoe, you, you, you're sort of, the style ends up being dictated at least in part by the technology and by doing an off court shoe, you're kind of freed from all that. You can do literally anything. So, um, I just think that opens things up a lot more and, uh, you know, you can sort of work it based on what you think might sell or, or what a guy's personal taste truly is. You know, I think with, with an on court product, like you're limited to carving names in the outsole or, putting a number somewhere on it you know th there's so many small things you can do but if you really want to show someone's personality in a shoe i feel like off court's kind of the way to go so nick you mentioned this and um i'll, br I'll bring it into the conversation here like there's there's the jordan future and the jordan shine now i absolutely loved the jordan future when it first first popped up i think russ you were the first one to actually post pictures of the jordan future right yeah, I think so. Officially, officially, yeah, officially, you had you had the first official shots. I I love that shoe. I thought it was great, but I feel like Jordan brand kind of ruined it with colors, so to speak. Like they they launched so many different versions of it in a really a short time span. Um, that kind of left that one in its own in its own world. But one key part of that was that it was like based on a legacy product. Same thing for the Jordan Shine. Now the Jordan Shine. Looks like a you know a pretty cool shoe. Looks like the quality was there, but the pricing was outside of the norm for a Jordan brand shoe, to say to say the least. So so Nick, I, I guess to kind of piggyback on Russ here and, and to, to start to start this conversation, can Jordan brand live creating a separate silhouette, or must there be some sort of connection to the past, like with the Jordan brand, about the Jordan Shine and the Jordan Future? I think, I think both can exist. I think that, you know, like kind of like what we were talking about earlier, there's something about that classic styling. Um, you know, the, the future to me was a really dope shoe, but it definitely was a newer feeling shoe. And I think that's why it was popular because it was like, oh, I've got a casual shoe. It has new style. But I'm also not paying, you know, like there's there's that Jordan 11 feel, but you're not paying that Jordan 11 price. And, you know, I think that's where the shine kind of missed the mark is that it was it was just way too expensive. And I get what Jordan was trying to do with it. You know, like all of their athletes are buying, you know, Balenciagas, like everybody in the that was any celebrity of any sort was buying Balenciagas for the last two years or whatever. So there was there was kind of a a reason to try it out, but I think that, you know, we kind of all saw that it didn't really work out the way maybe they had hoped. But I do think that like a shoe like the Westbrook Zero has the opportunity to 
to kind of pick up where that shoe left off in a sense where you know that, you know, like the style of, of an off court shoe, like Russ said, is, is, you know, what people want to wear, what the general public wants to wear. Now is Russell Westbrook the, the right person for that shoe and Jordan brand? I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily think so, but that's also because I'm comparing him to Michael Jordan and, you know, Michael, Michael, Michael had the swag of a ball player off the court. You know, those Jay-Z lyrics are, are, couldn't be any truer. And you just don't see that in today's athletes, you know, like even with somebody like LeBron, who is, you know, in my opinion, the best basketball player in the world right now, he doesn't have the same confidence that Jordan had when Jordan was playing. And that's the, the, you know, like it almost comes across as insecurity now where with, with Michael, I mean, we all got to experience it. And, you know, like we were talking about earlier, maybe we did experience the best time ever for what we're doing and for what we enjoy. Um, but I don't know, like uh, to me, you know, like that, that question might be even better answered by Brandon. He's a little bit more stylish when it comes to that stuff than I am. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty basic when it comes to my, my style choices. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, as far as what Jordan's done with some of the style stuff has been kind of hit or miss. I would agree with what all you guys have said in terms of the future. It just got oversaturated too quick. Same thing that they've done with Roshi, same things they've done with everything else. Had they left it at a certain level and did it the right way, it could have been a really big deal for them. Um, because, yeah, the price was cheaper than the 11, but it looked like the 11. In terms of like $400 high-end Jordans, even with the Pinnacle, I don't know how well those have sold. I could be dead off on this, but I just think like the average person, if I'm going to spend $400 on a pair of sneakers, like I'm going to go for a pair of Common Projects or something to that extent. Like I'm not going to spend it on Jordan brand no matter what kind of product they put out just because it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's to me the same as getting like a fully loaded Volkswagen for $40,000 versus getting, you know, an entry level Audi for the same price. Like you, it just, it doesn't equate. It's not the same thing. So it'll be really interesting to see how they move forward with some of the lifestyle stuff. I, you know, I feel they could definitely get it down. I think they have a stable of athletes where they could definitely get it accomplished. It just needs to be thought out right. And the design's got to be on point. And then it comes to a point where you can't really deny it. I was just going to say like th that kind of makes me wonder, like, you know, you mentioned four hundred dollars. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but for four hundred dollars, like, honestly, I'd rather have black cement threes, Nike Air on the back, and the quality of leather that came on the shattered backboards. Like that shoe to me is worth four hundred dollars. I, I don't. I, I'm not not saying that I want to spend four hundred dollars on it, but like. That's the only shoe I could possibly imagine paying four hundred dollars and not feeling like. Well, I how got much are the off. white cement fours that are coming out next year? Are they two fifty? I'm not I sure. I think those are going two fifty. I mean, I agree with you, Nick, all day. I'd pay two fifty for shoes like that done the right way. I think we used to joke about it in email threads all the time when we were at Complex, like don't release these retros for $150 and make them look like complete garbage. And I'm not even talking about Jordan brand. I'm actually talking about a lot of other brands that did it completely wrong. Like bring it back the way it was supposed to with the right technology, the right kind of leather, the right colorways, not starting off with a colorway that the player never wore. Do it right that way and charge me $200. I'll gladly pay for it. But when you give me garbage for $150, i am never going to mess with it again. I mean, I just wonder like, you know, maybe that and that kind of goes back to like the future of retro thing. But I wonder... You know, if there's almost a tiered thing you can do where it's like there's sort of a almost like jerseys where there's almost a mass market, you know, quote unquote swingman version of a Jordan 3 with a Jumpman on the back that's not super great. That's like 150. And then there's the premium like Nike Air on the back. The materials are all right. And it's like $300 or $400 that's like you know, the, the, the Mitchell and Ness Jersey equivalent. Um, you know, I think there's always going to be people who are willing to pay that much. And like, it's silly to make everyone kind of buy that lowest common denominator shoe. Like if you just want one that kind of looks like that, okay, fine. You can buy this, but if you actually want something high quality or something like, like you remember, then you have this higher price option. And sure, that's not for everyone, but Neither are Maybox, you know, neither are, neither are Mitchell and Ness jerseys. Like, there should be different versions of the same shoe, maybe. And maybe... Know, I'd push that. Yeah, and maybe that is, maybe that is you know, like the future of retro. Maybe 
maybe it's a Nike ID type of thing and you really get to choose to, you know, oh, am I just, am I going to wear these and I'm going to beat the hell out of them and only spend 150, 250, whatever it is. Or I'm going to buy like that one pair that I know I'm going to baby, I'm going to take care of it and it's going to be the Jordan 3 that I wear moving forward and I pay the 400 bucks and feel like I'm wearing, you know, the best of the so, best. I would say, so my thing, if I'm paying three yeah. or $400 yeah. for the shoe, like, I don't think that I'll be buying another one for another five, 10 years. Like, I, I would, that, like, to me, that's, that's like buying a really nice dress shoe. And, you know, for dress shoes, you can pretty much wear those for the most part for the rest of your life. You get them polished up and cleaned up or whatever, but, you know, you keep them nice, you can wear those for the rest of your life. And that's, that's where I, where I think three, four hundred dollars for a black Simmons three. Don't get me wrong. I'd probably play it regardless. But, but the point being, I, I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't think people, if, if people are going to pay that much, it can't, it has to be at a quality level from Jordan brand that I, I don't think we've seen with anything yet. But here's the thing though. People are paying that much now, you know, on the resale market or whatever. Like, I mean, look at flight club prices for some of those things, you know, it's like, a pair of the last retro black cement threes are going, I think they're going for that much, if not more, you know, and I think I wore mine like probably 10 times and gave them away because it was like, they're just not the same. They just didn't work for me. I would gladly spend that same resale price at retail for a pair that was done right. You know, it's like, I feel like it's been so long with all of us having to settle for whatever the one retro of a shoe is and you'll buy it because it's like, Oh, because it's this shoe and you don't have a choice. But if you have a choice, like, yeah, I'll gladly spend. I didn't even touch the Nike air ups. that came back last year. That was like my first pair of Nikes growing up. That was the shoe that got me hooked when they had the black and blue kind of player of edition with the one on the back for Penny Hardaway. When they brought those back, I, I that's probably the most excited I was for a retro shoe to come out in the last five, seven years or whatever. And when they dropped that, I mean, between the materials, because it went over to Nike Sportswear, them not even releasing it in the black and blue colorway, they did like every colorway but that. I mean, I, I'm just, I can't buy that stuff. I just, personally, I'm not even going to spend $120 or something like that. Like, I think they were on sale for close to $50 at one point, and I still couldn't do it. I mean, I, I kind of fell for it. I'm a sucker for that stuff. But yeah, it was like, that. that's a great example, because the material was like kind of like... Um, almost like that vacuum tech stuff that came out a few years back. It wasn't actually like leather. It was the panels weren't stitched together. It was actually just formed. And I, I mean, oh, yeah. though th- th- that's, that's something I think like will kill any type of retro from any brand, from whatever it is, because, you know, there's a certain element of like, okay, you can, you can do this with an air max 90 or an air max one, and you can add a little bit of technology and you can still have a good comfortable shoe. But those air ups were, you know, incredibly uncomfortable. And, you know, like I, I, I waited for them to go on sale cause I sat so long, but it, it's definitely one of those things where, you know, you see, you see a lot of the Nike basketball stuff come back in a, in a, you know, a twisted version of some sort where it's not, not fully a hundred percent what it was. And that to me is why that business seems to have struggled over the last couple of years because they've brought back some great silhouettes over the last three four years you know like a shoe like the lw the go lwp you know if you watched basketball back in the 90s that was a shoe you wanted or you had regardless you know we all know how well that shoe performs on court but then when it came back like the the market's so saturated with all this other crap that just doesn't live up to anybody's expectations that when they do bring back something that was good, because the LWP, the retro version, was actually pretty good, and I, I picked up a few colorways of it, and I was definitely happy with them. I'm I'm glad I did, but they didn't sell well, you know, comparatively to anything else, in my opinion. So, well, I mean, even the Command Forces, you know, it's like I yeah, thought that great Royal example. Color, the Command Forces would go right away because anytime anyone talked about like, oh, what do you wish would get retro, and it's like Command Force would always come up. Yep. And I feel like by the time it came out, you know, at 200 bucks, and then they put out like five different colors of it in pretty quick fashion, like I was still pretty surprised that original, you know, neon colorway went on sale, but it's true. It's like there's so much other stuff. 
Yeah, definitely. It's like you kind of have to make decisions at a certain point, like a two hundred dollars shoe. I mean, that's yeah, agree. It's a big investment. Agree. Can we? So, would you? Would you guys agree to like a, a retro consortium, for lack of a better word, kind of, kind of like Adidas does with like the the shell toes or whatever? Where they do like the consortium. You think that would be a better solution where they have like a consortium retros where it's like the ones, the threes, the fours, the fives that are just these high quality versions of the shoe. And then there's the normal everyday ones that are available all the time. I think that's how you get people to, to realize the difference and give them the option to pay for premium, you know, like, because, but you know, like the way Adidas does it with most of that being some sort of collaboration, you know, I don't think we'll see, I don't think, I don't think we'll see Jordan do collaboration with retros, you know, on, on a level like that for a long time, just because they still, even though they're falling off in the marketplace right now, they're falling off because they're not selling to the mainstream consumer, but they're still selling through that product, you know, whether it's to, uh, you know, a a slight discount on footlocker.com or to a reseller, they're still getting through that product and, and, you know, they're making their money off of it. But I mean, I look at it like, just like the basic Stan Smith. I mean, that white green Stan Smith, when they re-released it, they did like a, a basic model that sold it like Foot Locker or Foot Action or wherever for like 80 bucks. Yep. Or I don't even know, maybe 70 something. And then there was like the 115 or 120 version that they sold at like Barney's. Yep. You know, that had the proper flat tongue and the, the better leather and stuff. I mean, I think it's more like that. Where it's like, they sure, like to the casual observer, they basically look the same. And if you're that casual consumer, of course, you're going to buy the cheaper one because that's all you really want. But if you really care about how they're made and, you know, you want something that's going to wear in and like sort of like Jacques said, where you can wear it for a while and it breaks in and it, you know, it's like a dress shoe, like it it wears in, then you're going to pay for the more expensive one because that's what you want. Yeah, definitely. I think it's just giving more options. As much as, as dope as I think that would be. I feel like Jordan brand wouldn't do that because they would feel like the Jumpman logo would represent a lower tier than the Nike tier. And, you know, the, the Jordan brand situation is always like we are we are the premium product kind of thing. And so I just I was, as, as much as I would love that and I think you guys are dead on, they would have to find some other way to differentiate them because they couldn't they couldn't I put a Jumpman could- I mean, you're, but you're already doing it. You know what I mean? Like all you're doing is making a higher end version. Like you're not doing, you're not making a cheaper one. You're already making the cheaper one. The cheaper ones are what's true. I mean, you already, you know, maybe the sevens, I guess the sevens are better. You know, like some of the remastered stuff has certainly been better, but, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to like sell to both. You're trying to use one product to sell to two really different markets. I mean, there's the people who, you know, just want to buy the stuff, throw the box out and wear them just to have whatever the newest stuff is. And then there's the people like me and like us who are all freaking crazy, you know, who look at like, to use an example, that latest Barkley 94 retro. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, the eyelet pieces on the original were black and they're white on this retro. I don't right. want and that's that That's such a, and like, go ahead. You know, Russ, and I was like, going to get frustrated and go on a rant, but go ahead. <laughs> 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 no, and all, all I'm saying is like now, like if you're the freaking hyper detail oriented consumer like me or Nick or, you know, any of you guys, your only choice is to be like, well, all right, I don't want this or be like, oh, well, I wanted the white Barkley, so I guess I got to get these. Yeah. You know, all it is is like offering another option. You know, I can go if I'm a if I'm a Magic Johnson fan, I can go to the NBA store and I can buy an Adidas Swingman Magic jersey for like 90 bucks. And that's cool. But if I'm like a super Magic fan, I can buy a $260 Mitchell and Ness one. And if I'm the super fan, that's the one I want. If I just want to wear it to to rep Magic, then I, there's that other one. One thing fun. that I want to say real quick, um Kind of back to what Jock said as far as would Jordan Brand do that with the, you know, the tier, the level of, um, sorry, the level of the quality of it. Aren't they already doing that with the Jordan 1 between, you know, the OG high with the Nike Air all over it versus what they're doing with the Jordan Mid that technically just has 
the Jumpman logo and it's twenty thirty dollars cheaper. I know that's a little bit different than what we're talking about, but to an extent, they've already started doing that with the Jordan One. They definitely have. It's a it's there's definitely a difference in the materials and the quality on those highs versus you know the and even just the logo that they're the, choosing to the use. Jumpman logo. Yeah, but I also think that like you know you're talking about like. I, I don't have very many ones. I just haven't been, had any luck getting them. But like the shattered backboards are the only ones that I have that, uh, you know, I could say like that material. Like if that if that quality of, of leather was on all the rest of the Jordans, I would definitely be more apt to buy a significant amount more because when I got those, it wowed me. Like I was shocked at how good it was when I pulled them out of the box. And that hasn't happened in a long time, even with some of the other remasters that I bought. It was like, okay, this is good, but it's not like, it's not the difference between Foot Locker and Barney's like it, it was with the Stan Smith. You know, like that's a good point that Russ made where, you know, like you're, you're talking about two completely different consumers and customer bases there. But like, if you have the option, you know, and maybe that's, that's a way they could go in the future. Maybe it's, you know, like you're buying the, the, I just want to wear these, like the, you know, the NBA store Jersey version of the Jordan at Foot Locker or Finish Line or whatever, and you're buying the Barney's version or the, you know, the Mitchell Ness version, if you will, at Barney's or wherever else. No, but I, I agree 100. percent I, I I love the idea. I I'm all for it. If there was if there's anybody listening that has the power to make that happen, let's let's do that. I think I think they'll have a lot happier customers, and a lot of the complaining and stuff that you see happening online would hopefully would hopefully go away in, in the sneaker world but i mean we'll have to see the quality the quality like on those shatter backboards i don't have a pair but i've but i've held a pair it sounds weird um and they're definitely good like I feel, I feel like the same thing with those uh the oreo fours <laughs> the the black fours those black fours that came out like those felt like really good and solid really nice quality but we'll see where it goes. So let's talk. Let's talk signature line now with Jordan Brand. Obviously, we have a lot of talk about retros, and we can go on about retros because that seems like the dominant thing. But something that is interesting to me is the is the the path of the signature line. Like, how does how do they get the signature line back to where it's like a pinnacle product? I feel like like the I almost feel like the 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 signature product just happens. It's just like oh, like they they almost feel obligated to do it now. And it doesn't carry the same weight that a Droid signature product used to. How do, what's is that is that a, a product of today's just retro environment where everyone is so enthralled with retro product, or is that something that George or something Jordan Brand can do to really make that transition? Um, and I'll kind of start this off with just saying like I feel like the twenty nine was the the first time in a couple years that the signature line really stood on its own and really had like its own life. Um, obviously it was attached to Dwayne Wade before and all, all the other stuff that happened with it. But like the 28 started, kind of started with the 28 where it was like this, this technology was really something different enough that people were really like, oh, okay, this is something different. And then they had the 29 where it was like, okay, this is great. The materials on the upper is great. The feel is great. It plays wonderfully on the court. And you know, today it's still one of my favorite shoes to actually play in like to this day. But then I feel like it just kind of fell off. Like there was nothing, nothing else there. Like they had, a, like they talked about the pixel count on the upper and how they could do all these cool things with the upper, but none of that stuff really materialized. Um, you know, I'll I'll throw this to you, to you, Nick. Like, what do you like? How, what do you see Jordan Brand going from here with the signature line? I mean, I think it's I think it's tough to have a signature for a player that doesn't play. And you know, if Russell Westbrook is the face of Jordan brand, no offense. He's not Michael Jordan and he's not LeBron James. He's, I mean, you could argue that he's fourth, fifth, maybe even lower on the best players in the league right now, because, you know, like he, he hasn't won a title, you know, like he's playing with KD and you could have that whole argument of, Oh, Michael has Scottie Pippen and all of those things. But like, he just isn't the type of person you put a signature and run an entire, you know, like you would, you will never see 
Westbrook shoes as a subsidiary of Nike. And I think that's the thing that is the biggest challenge for Jordan brand with when it comes to business, you know, like their retro product is, is, is significant because of Michael Jordan and, you know, the, the newer stuff, you know, like I, I love the 28. I thought it was great. I thought, I thought the, the SE with, without the shroud was, was a phenomenal shoe. And, you know, like you said, the technology is there for it to be great and for it to be above and beyond what, um, you know, what, what most of the competition is doing really, but without a face on it, you know, and still trying to live off of Michael Jordan's legacy with it, it doesn't really fit into the mold that really Nike created, you know, like they created the, uh, the demand that we all kind of fell into as like, oh, I want to be, you know, wearing, like Russ said earlier, I want to wear the best shoe from the best player from the best team. This is, this is it. And, and they don't have that right now. And I don't really know how they're going to get that because, you know, there's a lot of competition in the NBA and even with a guy like LeBron, I don't know that he even, you know, like he's almost like not even in that conversation because you, you can't compare him to a Jordan because he doesn't have, you know, like you have all these other elements, you have social media, you have the fact that he's going to be on massive amounts of paid endorsement deals where Michael was on them, but we didn't, we didn't think, oh, Michael's getting paid to drink Gatorade. We all thought, I want to be like Mike, I'm going to drink some Gatorade, <laughs> you know, like now, now it's a completely different world. So unless, unless a player, I think if a player is groomed to really like be a superstar celebrity through social media, you know, and I think this is like, this is where like the intersection of like what Kanye has been able to do versus what athletes do. Entertainers have a lot, you know, like a lot of influence on what goes on in the world of fashion, of sports and all that. So until you get a player that fully grasps that and can kind of run with that and be like, you know, the, uh, the J.R. Smith or the Swaggy P and also be the best player in the league, you're not going to see some, you're not going to see a pinnacle shoe to the level that it once was for Jordan or for any other brand for that matter. Well, I guess, to, I mean, to piggyback on sort of what Nick said, like, you know, Jordan kind of built this paradox for themselves where it's like, if a player is good enough to be compared to Jordan or to somehow be seen as better than Jordan, like, they're not going to want Jordan's name on their shoe ahead of theirs. You know, I, I don't think LeBron or Kobe or, you know, those guys would have even signed with Jordan. Like, I feel like that's part of the reason they'd rather be on Nike and kind of build their own thing and do what Jordan did. You know, they don't want to be seen as like a subsidiary of Jordan, essentially, you know, which is the trouble of having such a visible former athlete as the name of your company. Um, you know, and I think by the same token, someone like a Dwayne Wade or or even a Russell Westbrook, if, you know, if Jordan is like, hey, we want you to be the face of our um, flagship shoe of the 28 or the 29 or the 30, which I'm very curious to see, you know, you're going to think like, well, wait a minute. If I'm good enough to be the top Jordan guy, why don't I have my own shoe? You know, and that's thing for Wade, like it worked for a little bit and then he got his own anyway. Um, you know, Westbrook got his own off court shoe, which is an interesting, same thing, an interesting way of sort of dodging that bullet. And maybe that'll work for them for a while. Although I agree with Nick that as great as Westbrook is, I, I don't know if he's like, you know, that guy. Um, so, you know, I don't know what the answer is. You know, they can keep signing guys like Kawhi Leonard, who's fantastic, you know, and have him wear the shoe. But, you know, I don't know if you're going to get the best player in the NBA to wear a shoe named for and as long as tinker's doing it designed for somebody else you know that that's a that's a lot for someone to take whose ego has to be ridiculously large just to get them to where they are you know it's like i that's like a a one in a billion chance like i well more than that because there's more than a billion people but whatever you know i i don't know if that person exists um 
who'd be willing to kind of do that. So Brandon, would you say, would you think the solution be, um, maybe they just take the, the Jordan name off, maybe not the signature line, but like Westbrook has his shoe as a, like kind of what Russ said, as a subsidiary of Jordan brand. So Jordan transcends the, okay, this is the player and it's, it's a brand as opposed to the player. So now we have the Westbrook on, on court shoe, whatever they call it, the Westbrook OC one, as opposed to the Westbrook zero. Is, is that kind of the solution to kind of start to, to build a legacy around the other players? Yeah, I mean, I think it's great that they're getting their names on the shoes and they're getting the opportunity to create something for themselves. But at the end of the day, I think we all know where it's coming from. We all know what it's going back to. It's part of Jordan brand. That's what he is. I mean, it's the same as when you look at, you know, musicians that have their labels built off something else, like Lil Wayne having young money off cash money. You still recognize it as cash money every day. It's kind of the same concept, in my opinion. So I don't know if it's really something where they're standing on their own by doing that. You know, obviously it's great for the player, especially if they can get, you know, better financial situation out of it, more branding out of it, all that stuff. Um, I don't think that that's the answer. You know, kind of back to what Russ and Nick said, like these guys are, they're warriors, they're tremendous athletes and with egos. And, you know, until they're standing on their own too, the way LeBron, Curry, Kobe, all these guys are, it's, it's really not the same. I don't see how you can mask it any other way. So uh, should we just separate the Jordan athletes from the signature line with, I, hmm, may, I don't know, I don't know. I'm just going through it in my head here. Maybe we just maybe we just don't have a signature athlete attached to the Jordan signature line. Maybe they all just have like their own own thing. Is that is that the way to give them their own room to breathe, but still let Jordan be Jordan and let them be a part of the of the brand? I guess I. I now that you guys say that and, and thinking about it, I'm sorry. I know I'm kind of rambling here. But I feel like it, it, it puts the Jordan athletes at a disadvantage to the Nike athletes because the Nike athletes at the end of the It does. Uh, basically, I was just going to say, if you look at the roster that Jordan Brands had since they initially started signing people in the late 90s, I mean, it, it's always been people that are strong, that are marketable, but it hasn't been, you know, the top three, top five players. You know, you look at people like Ray Allen, who obviously was amazing in his prime, people like Darius Miles, Quentin Richardson, uh, you know, Mike Bibby, you can go up and down the line. You know, they're great, they're recognizable, they're people that were in the sneakers that obviously could play, but, you know, they weren't the LeBrons, they weren't the Kobe's, they weren't that. So it's kind of a gift and a curse. It was a gift to be associated with Jordan because I think just having that, you know, the weight that that carries being a Jordan athlete obviously is a great thing, but at the same time it's kind of a curse because you knew it probably wasn't going to go much, much further than that, and that's you know likely why Wade left and decided to do his own thing with Lai Ning. Did I say that right? I don't, I don't, I've never said it out loud before, I don't think. I think it's leaning, but close enough. Leaning? <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> I think so. I think so. I always imagine it as leaning. leaning myself. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think, you know, one thing that, like, not to... Not to bring wish bad things upon somebody, but like I think it's actually interesting that Brandon used the uh, the cash money, young money, cash money reference because that the analogy is is actually kind of interesting, and I've kind of always this is definitely way for another another day, but I've always wondered like what that looks like, you know, like at some point does Jordan want to do his own thing? You know, like, and is this the start of, like, the, the trying to figure it out? Because I think we all anticipated that the 23 would be the last Jordan, and it didn't happen. And now I think we're in that same place with the 30, you know. But it's, it's become less of an annual thing. There's a lot of flexibility as to when it releases now. You know, like, there's always the birthday release, but it it doesn't necessarily always... It, it just doesn't have, seem to have the same consistency over the last couple of years. Um, but I wonder like if that's, you know, the, like you said, maybe it becomes something where if there's, if an athlete is signed to the brand, you know, cause there are, they're doing PEs and they're doing, you know, all these custom logos for all these guys. So does that ever equate to, you know, like, okay, the Blake Griffin line, you know, like the, the Westbrook line, you know, the Chris Paul line, like they do it with, with all of these guys get their own little things. But maybe that is the future. Maybe it maybe it needs to be broken down because, you know, kind of like how with the internet, you know, like you're 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 more likely to buy something that's 
localized to you in my opinion you know like that represents your favorite player your favorite color team whatever that is maybe that is something that that becomes a part of the picture and it's just you know I, like russ said though like I, the the, cha- the challenge is like finding that those people that don't have the ego because it's always going to have that Jumpman logo on it at this point. You know, like they're never going to go away from that because, because that's it's a what's so it's really, recognizable it's and iconic about Jordan. It's Jordan was named, you know, Eakin, for lack of a better word, sorry, uh, named Eakin. It wouldn't be such a big thing, I think. It'd be, the Eakin 3 or whatever would be fine as opposed to the Jordan 30 where it's attached. You know it represents that player and for that player to have such a huge personality and huge presence and known globally, how does an athlete on that roster separate himself from that person while still being a part of that individual label? Yeah, it's interesting. Good points. Good points, guys. Points, points, good points. <laughs> See, now I'm thinking. So, audience. Uh, the guys that are listening, thank you for st- tuning in to part two. Um, let us know what you think. Let us know what you think. What what what's the future of the Jordan signature line? What's the uh, what's the future of retros? Uh, we want to thank you guys for tuning in. Obviously, we appreciate you guys for listening. Um, thank you to our special guest, <laughs> Russ Bankston. Round of applause for the, Any for the sneaker guy. Any sneaker guy. Really honest. <laughs> really honestly, really happy. If you guys. <laughs> If you guys out there watching haven't read Russ's uh, slam cover with Iverson back in like 2000 when he had the full fro, that's what made me <laughs> want to write about sneakers. That is seriously like my favorite magazine feature story of all time. So if you guys get a chance, check that out online. I, I, I would definitely co-sign that. I mean, I, it's it's been an honor and a pleasure, like, you know, getting to know you and becoming friends with you, Russ, because I definitely looked up to you for years I before that. I Thank even you. got to Thank start you. writing about sneakers. So. I definitely appreciate you. Uh, <laughs> no, I, de- I, I, I appreciate you, what you've done and, and you know, how, how you've helped all this happen. Because really, like, you know, it, it's no joke that this this whole business, you know, started from your love of sneakers and <laughs> it allowed us all to kind of really realize like, hey, there's there's some dude that's just as crazy about me out there you know like into yeah, these I things mean, so cool thanks for coming out. on and thanks cool for sharing work, that's right. uh so <laughs> if you guys haven't yeah, already definitely uh, definitely for complex uh he does the rust report on fridays which i am lobbying to turn into some sort of video series uh, but apparently it hasn't happened yet no one's listening to my uh to my emails that i'm sending to tips at complex.com apparently <laughs> apparently nobody <laughs> cares um, but if you haven't followed Russ, it's Russ Bingston at Russ Bingston, T before the S. Uh, make sure you get that right because I I screw it up every time I tweet at him. Um, but I am I am Jacques Slade. Uh, you can find me uh, all over the web. It's all under Cousteau, K-U-S-T-O-O. Uh, this is Outside the Box, the podcast, uh, which is definitely representative of the sneaker world. And there's two guys here that really hold the weight. Again, I'm just here to run my mouth. Uh, so just give a big shout out to Brandon. Brandon, give him all your information. Hey, thanks everybody. You can follow me at uh, Mr. Brando three M R B R A N D O three, and make sure to follow my main man Nick Engvall. What do you got, Nick? Uh, Nick Engvall, N I C K E N G V is in Victor A L L. Just my name. Uh, yeah, on on all the platforms I use that. And uh, once again, thanks to Russ for for you know going going a little long with us and making this conversation happen because it was definitely enjoyable for me and i hope everybody that's listening enjoyed it as well no doubt thank you guys we'll do this again definitely all right guys uh outside the box outside the box hashtag follow that tweet us let us know what you think and we'll see you guys next time peace